Um, well, I'm excited to be here today as a Villanova alum. Um, it's always nice to come back to campus and do something other than basketball, which I'm a big fan of, but it's, I know the school is a lot more than that. So it's always good to be here for, uh, for other purposes as well. Um, and I know Dr. Weiss um, just gave a, a really exciting vision of, of what bre breastcancer.org is all about, um, what we hope to do in the world. Um, and so my goal today is to kind of get into a little bit more detail about how we make that all actually happen. Um, Dr. Weiss is a, a real visionary um, and a serial entrepreneur, I would say. And so she has fantastic ideas and has really led our organization, I think, to a place of um, being able to deliver um, really excellent services that have an impact on, on lives. Um, but we have to operationalize all of that. And we have to um, deliver it in ways that are, are meaningful and usable uh, for the people that come to us. And so hopefully I can share a little bit of that with you today. Um, so Dr. Weiss had this slide up, and it showed kind of her um, way of, of working with patients, which she calls the full life view. Um, this type of view is, is my view in life, because I am also a breast cancer survivor. I was diagnosed with breast cancer when I was 28. Um, I was in the middle of kind of my early career. I was working for a private equity company, um, traveling a lot, just busy with life, had a lot of friends, um, doing a lot of really great things. And one day, I felt a lump in my breast. And, my whole perspective on life um, changed from there forward. Um, so I was fortunate enough to meet Dr. Weiss when I was in kind of this hump right here. Um, and she was able to give me this perspective on my diagnosis. Um, and so that was extremely valuable for me, saying, OK, this is a really scary thing to be facing as a 20-something. But there's a whole, whole huge life in front of me. And how do I get through this point? I was lucky enough to be diagnosed with very early stage disease. Um, and move on to the rest of my life. Um, the other thing that was really fortunate about meeting her at that point was that I was also able to come to work for breastcancer.org through my um, meeting her. So I'm really grateful for that as well. When I was diagnosed, it was um, 10 years ago. So it was 2006. And even at that point, um, I think we were beyond the yellow pages of the internet. But uh, you know, the internet was still in very early stages. But one of the first things I did when I was diagnosed was immediately start Googling. You know, what's breast cancer? What are these terminology you know, that I'm being thrown? I was an accounting major in college, so medical anything was definitely mumbo jumbo to me. Um, and not only was I searching the internet, my circle of friends and caregivers were also searching the internet. So I had a friend who was a nursing student here. Um, she immediately Googled all you know, the best doctors in Philadelphia, who do you go see? And we had all these piecemeal things going on. Um, and they all ultimately were beneficial to me, but they took time. But that was the best technology that was available to us back in 2006. Move 10 years down the road, and the opportunity to kind of centralize a lot of those different information outreach efforts and the conversations that I was having um, is really different today than what it was 10 years ago. And so what's exciting for me working at breastcancer.org, I'd always hoped to work in a more socially driven organization, but I also had a little bit of um, fear that I would be in a place that it was kind of a um, more stagnant kind of environment. And working in a technology organization that also has a social purpose has allowed me to kind of pursue some of that um, socially driven career perspective, but also live in a kind of dynamic environment. Doing it from a nonprofit perspective is especially challenging because we don't have access to capital in a lot of ways that some technology companies do. So to be able to do the type of development that we want to do as quickly as we want to do it has proven challenging. Um, so today I kind of want to talk through how we work um, to partner with the patient, how we gather patient perspectives um, before we even think about the technology. How do we really understand the patient, where they're coming from, as well as the whole ecosystem that she's operating in. Then, how do we take that, think about the technologies that are available to us, how we can harness those and choose the best ones, um, and then also how we operationalize that and actually come up with the budget to do some of the projects that we do. Because as great as wanting to do social good is, and as great as finding the right technology is, if you don't have the funding to get there, you're kind of dead in the water. And so us as a nonprofit, that's been particularly challenging. And I think kind of in the past um, 18 months, we've really come up with some interesting ways to approach that that are different than what we've historically done. Um, and so hopefully I can share a little bit of that with you today. I guess it would be great to understand a little bit of kind of who's in the room and what your kind of perspectives are coming here. I feel like 
we don't have a ton of students. Do we have a lot of, any students? Some, a few, okay. And then I guess if people want to say kind of what, why they're here, their background, just not everybody, but if anybody wants to share, I know I met a couple of you at the end of the practice, or if there's anything you really like to get out of this before I kind of dive right in, um, I would love to hear that up front so I can try to do that as I go along. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Sunny Hallowell. I'm a professor at the College of Nursing. I okay. recently um, participated in the Social Innovations Lab in the city of Philadelphia. My innovation called King is sort of trying to link patients from the hospital to home. It's okay. a mobile health application. Um, so I'm very interested in knowing a bit more about not just um, all aspects of this, but how you actually um, measure things mm. once you actually receive the data, like what the actual metrics are. Um, that would be helpful. It's a very interesting topic. Yeah, I gotcha. Go ahead. Um, Kate Dudak, I work at Christiana Care Health Systems, um, the enterprise architect for a care management platform. We do a lot of big data anal analytics right now, but it's what I'm really interested in is how do you bring that social data into your healthcare data, and it's also like how do you partner? We mm -hmm. have a lot of really great data about these cancer patients. I have a whole team of care managers that are working with cancer patients. Mm -hmm. How do you link that up and yeah. do data sharing, especially with like the HIPAA concerns and everything else and the, the differences between how you store your data and how we store our data and how do you connect those systems to communicate? Gotcha. Okay. Anybody else? Go ahead. I work in business intelligence and technology at Bloomberg and just interested in kind of how you approach the data and then We should just had a whole data, like a whole data <laughs> topic. I thought about doing that more on analytics and the data piece, but they seem to want to kind of under, do, focus a little more on what we're doing. But we'll, we can definitely get to that. It sounds like there's a lot of interest there. Anybody else? Go ahead. Um, I'm Gabriella. Um, I'm a alumni nursing student, and mm -hmm. I'm a nurse right now at Little Hospital. And um, I'm just interested to kind of hear about the technology, because I'm like very much on the patient front, but it's Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Go ahead. Um, my name is Regan Durini. I graduated from Philadelphia in the Bachelor of Science and Analytics program. Mm -hmm. um, I currently work as an analytics engineer at Capital Cross, a health insurance company in Harrisburg. Mm -hmm. So I kind of come from like the insurance, the you know the analytics of the data, but the insurance side. Um, I actually am switching career paths and I'm moving towards moving back to Philly for um, I'm moving into the education uh, field, um, okay. but still coming from the health insurance. Background. I'm just interested in the data and, you know, on the, the headset. Sure. Okay. Great. It's a lot of data questions. Mm -hmm. That's good. All right. So we're going to um, start to move through here. So, on the partnering with the patient side, I mean, the patients come first, right? So, if we're not serving the patient and ultimately um, working to improve her health outcome, all we're doing is, you know, what's kind of the point? So, we try to keep the highest goal of the patient. Um, in the forefront of everything that we do. Because there is, there's a ton of other people in our ecosystem. There's a lot of you know, competing interests for data and access to our patients, and it's very easy to get distracted. So we always try to keep the patient and their needs at the forefront of everything we do before we go anywhere else. Um, we do have the benefit of being around for 16 years and of having 16 years of interaction with patients. Um, like Dr. Weiss was saying, we do have a very large online discussion board community. It's a little rudimentary at this point if you take a look at it, but it's extremely active. And these women are extremely actively sharing the information that um, they're you know, having about both the, the support needs that they have emotionally and the medical questions that they have um, within kind of a peer support community. So we have a lot of history to work on, but we also know that the landscape um, of healthcare, of technology, they're all changing so quickly that we constantly need to re-engage with the patient and refresh um, kind of how we're approaching them. So one thing, um, which if you're in technology, a lot of what we do before we get into a project is that we're looking at developing personas. Who are the people that are coming to our site, to our tools, um, and what perspective are they coming with? And so it's not enough for us to say it's a woman with breast cancer. There's so many subset populations within that that we have to take um, consideration of whenever we're approaching something. So we have the healthy woman, someone who uh, may not be diagnosed with breast cancer. She may or may not have a family history. Maybe she's going for a mammogram. She wants to know about that. She wants to um, understand kind of how breast cancer impacts her life pre-diagnosis. 
Um, we also have the newly diagnosed woman. This is when most people come to us. Most people right now come to us through a Google search. So I think 75% of our traffic um, is coming to us through just somebody typing something in Google and funneling into our site. We have um, a really complicated system of, of meta tagged data um, and really great SEO performance because we've been around so long and we've really done a great job of structuring our site. So people come very deeply into our site. They're not coming right to our homepage for the most part. They're coming right deep into the data. Um, so we have this newly diagnosed population. I'm going to kind of shift over here. Um, you know, we have people that once they get diagnosed, they have early stage disease. So they're going to likely, you know, come, get diagnosed, uh, go through some treatment, and then return to their normal life. But like Doctor said, they're going to have kind of everlasting um, questions and concerns about breast cancer. We also have late stage management. So these are people that are, are living with a disease chronically um, and will have continual need for information, um, treatment support, all those types of things. We have survivors. Um, and so people that are fully out of, out of their diagnosis but also need to keep getting mammograms, MRIs, follow up. And then obviously people with, you know, have their support system. So we get a lot of caregivers that come to us and have questions. Um, you know, my wife is, you know, dealing with breast cancer. I want to know how to support her. Or, you know, um, a younger person who may be coming to our site to research things for their grandparent um, or parent or whatever. So these are kind of historically a lot of how we've kind of segmented our population um, and try to develop things. What we're learning, and especially with the new technologies available, is that we also need to look at it um, in a slightly different way. We need to consider these personas, but we also need to think about how people are consuming their information, what their individual preferences are. Because like Dr. Weiss was saying, no two people are the same. So you might have two people with an early stage diagnosis, but they're going to come to us and look for our services in very different ways. If we ultimately want to impact their health outcome, we may need to deliver our information in very different ways for those two people. Um, and so the way we're kind of looking at it at this point is we have a lot of people that come to us that are researchers. They want to know every definition of every you know, word that they hear in the doctor's office. They want to understand every treatment. They want to understand every um, trial study, kind of the real detailed information. And so we have that. We can serve that need. But that person you know, is a real data heavy, um, you know, might sit and read an article for you know, 15 minutes if they want to. We have people that um, are looking more for emotional support. So these might be people that want more peer-to-peer -peer kind of social interaction. They want to hear from somebody who's in the thick of it with them, um, how, how they're working through it. And they might ultimately get the same information, but they're just looking to get it in very different ways. Ultimately, we want all of our users to be decision makers. So we want them to take all this information that they're getting and not just read it, but to actually use it to change their um, behavior and ultimately impact their health, health outcome in a positive way. So this is the, the change of behavior piece is the, the real challenging piece. We can you know, distribute information and give peer support all day long, um, but to actually get people to make some of those behavior changes is what's really challenging, but I think that's where um, a lot of the technology opportunity lies. Um, and so we'll get to more of that. And if you have questions along the way, feel free to interrupt me as we go. We'll, we'll kind of get through it. Um, and like we've been saying, you know, it's not just the patient and their caregiver. There's this huge ecosystem that we operate in. And that speaks a lot to the data, right? So there's all this patient data. And there's a lot of data that's getting you know, put in at kind of the EMR level, at the medical level. Um, but I think we do have the opportunity for the rest of our ecosystem to be collecting not just that EMR data, um, but also kind of some of the support needs they have, a lot of the side effect data that they have, um, patient reported data, not just kind of the medically collected data. And so we have the whole medical community, um, the oncologists, the surgeon, nurses, nurse navigators, genetic counselors, um, then also kind of the healthcare administrators. So um, how people um, in the health systems on the operation sides are, are uh, making investments in disturb determining how they deliver their services. Um, insurance companies, um, there's, you know, that's a, a whole area of interest right now. We're not going to spend a ton, ton of time on that because there's so much kind of up in the air on that. But there's, I mean, like you were saying, all the insurance companies and, um, you know, whether it's a, a government provided health care or it's um, a private insurance company, there's a ton of questions and needs there. Um, as well as wellness service providers. I mean, one of our goals is to really help people understand that it's not just the medical piece, but it's also diet, nutrition, all those types of things, um, lifestyle that really can have an impact. 
Pharma companies, both from a marketing point of view, um, both you know, getting treatments out there, understanding um, the impact of those treatments, understanding the side effects and what people are dealing with um, and the treatments that they've developed. And also um, research and clinical trials is a huge area um, where we think we can potentially buy, provide some benefit. And then there's others in our community, can other cancer nonprofits that we work with, um, EMR companies, and a number of other digital health companies. So there's all these people that you know, we're kind of aware of as we're developing um, our tools um, that can be our partners, that can potentially be our funders, um, and that they all have interest in, in need and um, want access to our patients in one way or another. So this might be, you don't need to read everything on here. This is um, kind of a taking that nice um, full life view chart and saying, okay, what do we do? Like, that's a great concept, but what do we do with it? Like, how do we, how do we turn this into some kind of tool that people can carry around with them and, and do something actionable with? So what we do is um, we really try to break it down and we look at it both from the patient perspective, also on um, the provider perspective and really think about, okay, the system as it stands now, What's missing? What is, what is not getting accomplished with the tools and services that are already out there? Um, and where can we play a role in that? And so, you know, it kind of up here on the top is kind of the medical kind of components of what happens. And we, um, you know, have done our research both through patient interviews, um, provider interviews, mining the data that's on our site, listening to the conversations that are in our community. Um, and really trying to figure out, okay, what, what's happening? So just a couple examples of these. So, from a communication perspective, at the time of diagnosis, I mean, that's just a huge moment of confusion for people. They're meeting with potentially multiple doctors at one point in time, genetic counselors. There's all this piecemeal information. They might be all in one health system. They might, as I was, decide to go to different health systems for different services. So even if you have all of one piece of your data in one EMR, you may have some other stuff over here. Um, and you're trying to figure out how to kind of centralize all of that. So there's this kind of moment up front where you know, there's complete confusion and you need a place to kind of centralize all these different pieces that are coming at you and figure out how to get those to work together. Um, there's also just up front from like a clinical perspective, so from like a provider, um, an insurer perspective, um, even a pharma uh, or diagnostic company perspective, at this point that once you get kind of a, a mammogram and you see us a, um, a suspicious um, lump there that a lot of times your surgeon is in control kind of until after surgery. At least 50% of the time, you're not even seen an oncologist until after, you know, kind of this surgery and biopsy moment is completed. There's some real critical decisions that if you met with an oncologist earlier that you could make that really might have a significant impact on your treatment. So that's not really happening on the clinical delivery side. So what can we do there? So it kind of goes from there. And so we're trying to really identify opportunities where we um, kind of as a neutral party can kind of insert ourselves and either deliver information or warehouse data or do something that's going to improve the patient experience and ultimately their health outcome. Question. Yeah. I'm just curious, so is the shift in behavior because of, you know, the fact that, you know, this is how we always did it or is it because of insurance? You know, hey, you can't do X until you do Y. So what are the barriers to that behavioral change? So there's a couple things there. I think the biggest thing is that we're really fortunate in breast cancer that there's been a ton of research. But with that becomes a ton of options. So there's all kinds of different diagnostic tests that can be performed. There's all kinds of different treatment options. There's just so many choices. There's not kind of a one size fits all approach to treatment. So a woman based on her age, based on her family history, based on you know, her particular genetics and genomics of her disease, she has so many options available to her that it's become so complex that there's so many different pieces of information and moments um, where kind of that journey can get off track and also just get more and more complex and confusing for her. Um, I think that's a big piece of it. And obviously, I mean, you know, insurance and kind of navigating that um, is, is definitely a piece of it. That varies a lot by woman and kind of what type of coverage she has and that type of thing. But all women are kind of facing this type of complex medical environment. Yeah. I just want to thank you for this image. Okay. Because as a, as a clinician, mm -hmm. I can tell you, I can take this image and put it into any hospital situation or 
or somebody gets vicious from them. It's the same as Mary Naylor's sort of transition to the care model, which we use in older patients. Mm -hmm. but, but what you identify here is applicable across healthcare, which is actually super helpful for so many different realms, not just breast cancer. So, kudos. Thank you. It's, Thank it's you. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, and that's. I mean, kind of a, a side note is that we think a lot of what we're doing is very applicable to other disease states. I mean, not just within oncology, but other, you know, other areas. And so, I mean, our dream, you know, our far, far down the road dream is that we can take what we've done and expand that to other disease states and, and try to, you know, benefit the ecosystem even more broadly, ultimately. But, you know, there's, we're going to get breast cancer done first, and then, <laughs> then we'll worry about the rest. Yeah. Maybe the analytics of it, but I'm a little curious, aside from, like, Yeah, so we'll get to that a little bit more um, as we go. And that was a whole kind of other presentation that I could have done. Um, and that's something as we are looking at all of these questions is thinking about, okay, what can we build within the tools that we're considering to collect the data that we need to really measure that? Because it is, I mean, you know, Google Analytics can tell us a ton of things, but it can't really tell us a whole lot about health outcomes. So, um, you know, we also have to consider where we are today and where we want to be in five years, um, the tools that we can use to collect some of that data now versus some of the more automated tools. So, I mean, ultimately, we would love to be able to connect into EMRs, um, even into like prescription refill services, those types of things, so we can see, you know, are people adhering to their medications? Are they getting their, you know, medications refilled? Um, are they getting to and staying to a healthy weight? Are they, you know, physically active? Are they getting the rest they need? There's all these types of things that we could measure. Um, and so right now we're kind of in an in-between place of collecting re patient reported information through surveys and that type of thing, and then eventually transitioning, hopefully, into more and more integrated tools that will help us collect hard, fast data that we can, you know, really rely on. But we'll, we'll get to more of that. Um, so based on kind of identifying those gaps, we've done kind of an initial um, look at where, where are kind of some areas where we could focus product development on. And so at the back end is always this database, right, all this data out here. And then we have, you know, our, um, our engaged members here. And then so we have different tools. And so ultimately what we develop um, will likely not just be one, you know, single thing. It'll be, you know, a suite of products. Um, but ultimately, hopefully, all the data is going to one place so that we can utilize it in um, powerful ways. And so there's this ongoing kind of need for personalized education and community projects. So personalized information and support, a lot like what we do now, but just in, the, in a much kind of more sophisticated way. Um, for example, up front, it might have kind of a risk assessment tool. So before you're even diagnosed, you figure out, what's my real lifetime risk of breast cancer? What do I need to be concerned about? And then you know, if you're diagnosed, getting in through that. Um, there's also, for this hump of treatment, this real concierge moment. Concierge has kind of a, I don't know, not always a positive kind of to tone to it. So, you know, we would not use that word. Um, but really, how do you get people through this most critical period? How do you deliver services um, that are, you know, needed in that point in time? And then this big, long stretch, this whole survivorship period is a huge, you know, opportunity, I think. A, a lot of people get out of treatment, and then they're kind of left um, they get some kind of survivorship plan because you're required to from your provider. Um, but, you know, how do you, how do you deal with those kind of lingering side effects, those ongoing questions that you might have? And so how do we keep people engaged, not just through this hump of treatment, but how do you keep people engaged during kind of the tail end um, over here so they can keep achieving things on their full life view? Um, and ultimately, so you're collecting data that you can feed back into your database, so you're not just looking at kind of the most critical time, but that you're also looking at kind of this full span of data um, as long as possible. So you ultimately, so we can track the health outcomes. The longer we can keep people engaged, the longer we can see the impact that we're having. Sorry, yeah. No, yeah, no, go ahead. Um, so I'm just curious with engagement. I'm wondering, is there, are you able to measure if there's any disparity in those number of people that are being engaged? I would imagine the people that have access to the internet that, are able, that would be savvy enough to go to you and, and get the information and then synthesize it would be a certain type of person, not necessarily our highest risk group. Well, that's, that's a huge challenge. And so that's you know, what we're looking at and how we ultimately deliver some of these tools. Right now, we really you know, are only 
getting to the people that come to us, that are going, that are Googling, that are, ser that are searching us out. Um, and we know, I mean, that is a very defined population. It's, you know, um, it's not getting to the most critical patients that we likely need to get to. And so we foresee in the future, I mean, always kind of having a widely available searchable product, but we also know that we need to look at ways of delivering this tool through other mechanisms to get it to the people that really do need it. Because yeah, right now, if, you know, if somebody's not Googling breast cancer, some you know, hospitals and doctors were very recommended you know, by, um, by other clinicians, but you, know, you really need to get somebody that's motivated to come, that come to us. And so we need to find ways to get to people that don't kind of have that same initial motivation level and find ways to engage them so that they see value and we're delivering and, and we can keep them. So that was kind of the patient perspective and how we kind of look at kind of how we look at our ecosystem, how we look at the patient, how we collect all that information, what's the patient journey. So before we even get to the technology, kind of what are all those pieces that we have to understand? Um, the technology piece um, is, is kind of the next nut to crack. And so um, that's honestly where we are right now. We're really kind of in this, these second two phases of work. So I might not have like totally definitive answers for you on all these things, but I can at least talk to you about some of the things that we're considering, um, what we've looked at, what we've learned, um, and how we're you know, kind of trying to move that forward. So this chart, um, Dr. Weiss also showed, but just to talk about it a little bit more operationally. And so these are you know, all these big, you know, all these data moments. So right now, we have a decent amount of health data. Um, and we have a fair amount of social interaction information from our community. The behavioral piece, we don't have a ton of information on yet. And that's what the tools that we're building um, really need to begin to collect. The health data right now is all patient reported data. So we aren't subject to HIPAA or anything like that at this point. Um, ultimately, we would like to get to a point where we can interact with EMRs because our concern is that you know, our health data is only as good as what the patients are supplying. And so that is concerning to us because if somebody, you know, slightly enters the wrong information, it can really change, you know, what, what they're potentially going to see. Um, and so that is one of our biggest challenges is to figure out how to capture um, the most accurate health data possible because it all hinges on that. If we're not getting the right health data, then we can't direct everything that we're doing as well, you know, as well as possible. So um, what the patients are doing right now is that we had a very successful um, pamphlet that was about understanding your pathology report. And so someone would go into their oncologist's office, they would have you know, this pathology report, which is a very complex, confusing medical document. And it would tell people um, how big their tumor was, you know, what grade it was, if it had certain characteristics. Um, and so we had a, a booklet that we found was extremely popular where a healthcare professional could sit down and go through this technical medical document and take those specific characteristics of an individual's um, cancer and kind of put them out in a very usable format. And then the rest of the pamphlet gave some um, definitions of what those things were and that type of thing. What we did about five years ago was take that and make it more of kind of um, an electronic, slightly more intuitive um, document and so um, not document but kind of a, a tool so people can go to our site now they can take their pathology report and hopefully understand it and be able to interpret it and then answer questions the questions that we did you know a ton of usability testing and a ton of work to try to get the questions phrased properly to solicit the best information possible and there's also ways for women to um, read definitions within the questionnaire so they can understand what we're really asking for. But the problem is, it's not, all path, it's not a standardized report. The pathology report's not a standardized report. And so we can't just say like, your pathology report probably looks like this, you know, because there's so many different ones. But right now, um, we think we're doing a pretty good job. And we have over 50,000 people that have just, without us really asking a whole lot, but just kind of having this tool on our site um, that have come and entered this health data. So they put in um, when they were diagnosed, what the various characteristics of their, um, their pathology was, what, um, what treatments they've had, what surgery they've had, um, all those types of things, even some information about side effects that they might be having. Um, and based on all of that that they enter, the data on our site is all meta-tagged. It's all very meticulously meta-tagged so that we can deliver, based on the characteristics that they're, they've provided to us, we can deliver um, different, you know, 
written content um, that applies specifically to them. It's not perfect and we're constantly refining it, but it was kind of like Dr. Riss was saying, it was our first kind of toe in the water, this concept of personalization. Um, there's some things it does really well. There's some things that we know it needs to do better. But at least it's given us um, an opportunity to see how frequently people are accessing that type of information, what they're doing with it. Um, and one of the projects that we're doing right now, actually, um, with um, University of California at Berkeley, they partnered with a pharmaceutical company to give grants to cancer nonprofits to take the data that we're generating from that personalization program and look at it to understand what impact it's actually having on our patients. So if people engage with that program, is it helping them? Is it really impacting their treatment and how? Um, and so we're in the process of evaluating all that right now. Um, the social interaction piece, like I said, we have, you know, their social interactions on our site. We've learned a lot about how these women want to communicate, um, the tools that they're using. Um, and so there's more to be done there. But the behavioral piece, I think, outside of a few questions we ask within our our personalization tool um, is the piece that we need to learn more and more about. And so, yeah. Did you get her hand up? Okay. Her oh, no, go ahead. Well, sure. I just have a question about the social interactions and how you collect that data. Is it just based on how they're using the website and where they're going, or is it like, you know, other stuff? So right now it's just within our site. And so we need to understand, I mean, we do look kind of from Google Analytics. We can see a little bit, you know, kind of, what other sites are people using, kind of how, what their kind of overall behavior is as much as, you know, we're able to. Um, we do have a lot of um, reporting tools within our community to understand kind of um, how frequently people are posting, what, you know, where they're interacting the most, where they're interacting the least. Um, and so there's a lot of, I mean, there's also a lot of just, we've had the same moderators for years, and so they're, you know, we field surveys from time to time, too, about different tools that they're using and kind of the, the different interactions we're having. We're also following people because we know them so well because they're such, like, a dedicated, engaged user base. Um, and so our, like, our, um, our social tools are not fantastic, and so um, some of them have gone off, you know, to Facebook groups and things like that, so we're watching their social behavior over there um, and how they're, um, kind of utilizing some of those tools in different ways than what we're able to provide for them. Um, and so that's kind of influencing the, the tools that we hope to create. Yeah? On the behavioral data, I mean, I know you guys don't have infinite quantities of, mo of money, obviously, yeah. but um, I know that a lot of universities um, get data from people like Amazon, mm -hmm. and places like that, to do analysis of purchase patterns and so forth, so it's like that. Have you thought about you know, obviously you can't go and buy one of those big databases that say, yes, and they bought this kind of car and this kind of thing, which is what we obviously do in the, in the online marketing space. But yeah. Finding universities that have begun to build out uh, behavior databases as part of research projects might be a way for you to be able to pump in more behavior data. Yeah. No, that's a really good, it's a good point. Um, and that's, I think, you know, initially... Um, that's a way for us to start. And that's, you know, we're talking to a variety of organizations um, and always open to those conversations because that's, you know, as a nonprofit, we can't build everything from scratch. There's no reason to. There's so many things out there um, that, you know, we try to bring in, you know, as much partner opportunity as we can to try to solve some of the things that people are already working on. There have to be some dazzling databases. I mean, I talked to some people Oh, gosh, eight years ago at Carnegie Mellon, mm -hmm. they were analyzing Amazon purchase data. To, yeah. To, and, and as they were beginning to put the whole recommendations mechanism in place, and uh, you can only imagine that they've been pumping that database up over the last eight years. Yeah. And no, there's definitely partnerships might work for you pretty well. Yeah, I think. Um, we definitely, and I'll get to it, but one of the um, the digital health organizations that we're working with, they. Um, the, the thing is always to get the right data that can best inform what we're trying to do. Um, and so it's, you know, both kind of general consumer behavior that we need to be aware of and then also kind of how people are operating within the health space. And so it's kind of taking all those perspectives and kind of bringing them to see how that, you know, behavior within the health space works. But also we need to do this in a, in a very... Um, intuitive and comfortable way for people. So that's what we hope to, you know, incorporate um, technology that allows people to kind of approach health in the same way they do a lot of other aspects of their life. So it's kind of a comfortable, um, predictable, kind of, you know, easy place. There's a local company that, um, oh gosh, whose 
name I suddenly forgot, but uh, who have actually, their whole thing is around what sites people have visited, which mm -hmm. might feed into this. Well, yeah. If I remember the name of the company. Yeah, definitely let me know. Yeah. That'd be great. Um, and so um, Dr. Weiss talked a little bit about this over here. And this comes, this is, you know, from a, a data perspective where I think, you know, we can become even more powerful. And so right now, um, I would say, you know, we are starting to collect some of this data. We kind of sit in the middle, so we're holding that data. And then we're delivering out, ultimately, we hope, solutions across the board here. Um, right now, we have all this content, right? We have like thousands and thousands of pages, the most breast cancer or medically vetted content out there, as well as community support. Um, so we have content, we have um, you know, a lot of research information, uh, we have a peer support community, um, and so you know, we have some point of care content that is being distributed through health systems, not widely. Um, and so what you know, we hope to do is be able to provide the educational information, the peer support, but then put some tools in the middle here to be able to track what people are actually doing with all that information. So how, you know, how is the education that we're providing, how is the peer support um, that they're receiving, how is that ultimately um, impacting their weight management, their medication adherence, their quality of life, um, you know, some of those other critical things, um, and also you know, helping them make the decisions that they need. And so this is all kind of a, you know, I don't know. It's not final, this is all kind of in process, and. There's a lot of other things going on with it right now. But um, so these are kind of some of the, the concepts that you know we talk about and, and how to incorporate these into the tools that we're providing. Um, you know, we've had conversations with the IBM Watson, and we've done a lot of projects with like the Morris of Kettering and understanding cancer care. And, and so we've you know had conversations with them. Um, and you know, how can how can we take what has already been done in a lot of those places and harness that for the tools that um, we hosted? develop or partner with um, to provide care in the space of breast cancer. Um, and so from you know, a cognitive computing aspect, so I guess I'll start down here. From a machine learning perspective, I mean, all the meta tagging of our data and kind of the user behavior that we see now, we have a lot of information. We need to more kind of move into the upper quadrant um, of, of really taking that and making it a little more predictive. So right now, someone really has to come to us with a question. And we'd like to kind of move that to a place of saying, okay, this is kind of where I am in my disease, and based on what I know about this person, um, this is the information that they're going to use. And not just from a medical perspective, but also um, from kind of a social perspective. Like, hey, you told us that you're, um, you know, you have young kids and you've just gotten diagnosed with breast cancer. Here's some information on how to support you through conversations with your family, kind of to give that holistic approach. Um, the analytics piece, we kind of started to talk quite a bit about, um, but how can we harness that data um, and you know, take it to a place where we're able to use it to um, improve the services that we're providing so that we can um, feed it back. I mean, you know, pharmaceutical companies have a huge appetite um, for understanding kind of some of the patient experience and, and kind of sit in a trusted place. And so for all of this, you know, privacy um, and you know, respect of the patient information is, is critical. Um, but, you know, is there ways that we can do it in a way that's comfortable for patients and take some of that data um, and be able to kind of feed it back out to the ecosystem so that they're able to, you know, further develop solutions and provide care in a better way. The integrated digital platform really speaks to kind of, okay, we have this community tool now, we have this content, how do we, how do we bring everything together into um, a more user-friendly, kind of um, easily uh, integrated, you know, into their daily life platform, like Dr. Weiss was saying. I mean, right now you, you know, have to go to the website and find us. Um, is there a way for us to kind of integrate with her every day so that, you know, we can pop reminders up on her phone? Is there a way that we can say, hey, you know, like, we're supposed to take the medication now, or, you know, um, we see you have a half an hour free in your schedule today, and, like, you need to go take a walk, you know, maybe it's a good time for some physical activity, or, hey, we see you have this doctor's appointment coming up. Here's some information that might be relevant to you um, to have before you, you know, you get to that appointment. Um, all of those things are, are possible. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, building the right tools to, to bring all those. Um, and so I won't spend a ton of time on the market opportunities, so we can a little bit to your question. But um, 
you know, this is the, the big piece for us. You know, a $5 million a year budget allows us to kind of keep our website updated. It allows us to develop our social tools to a certain extent. It allows us to, a lot of our budget is spent on content creation. There's a lot of content out there, and that's one thing I think we can transition a little bit, is rather than having to create all of our own content, is being able to curate um, and review and bring others' content in so we can focus more of our budget on the technology aspect of it. Um, but it also is a, a place where you know we're trying to really understand kind of where where um, are potential funding partners within this whole process. Um, you know what what's pharma you know interested in? We already have a lot of relationships with pharma, and they, they do a lot um, of our funding actually at this point, although it doesn't affect any of our content. Um, you know, would users pay to for a product? We don't think so. You know, these people are in a pretty critical time in their lives. A lot of them need to do without another cost of their plate. Uh, but it's a question we ask. Uh, but are there other sponsors that would pay for these types of products? You know, would health systems love a more integrated product? Would you know our services, public health navigators, um, really do their job better? And you know, can we reduce the cost of care by answering some of these questions up front, keeping the doctor's appointments a little more streamlined, be able to answer answer questions for people at home? Um, you know, we believe the physician and the care team have a highly respected place in this ecosystem, and there's no you know point at which we're looking to to really change that, um, that has to remain at the forefront. But is there, you know, kind of supplemental things we can do to kind of take out, you know, some of kind of the frustration points with those processes? And would people pay? Would people pay for that? Um, and so obviously the data, the data is a huge, you know, monetization opportunity for us as well. Um, and so obviously looking at all of that. Um, and so these are kind of the three areas that we're looking at. We continue to see philanthropic contributions of foundation dollars, although I think, although I think with this type of um, technology play and, and kind of real impact and, and ability to use the data to measure some of the outcomes we have, there's some different philanthropic opportunities that we haven't been able to take before that I think we can. Um, there's in the healthcare system management space, I mean, there's obviously opportunities to, to to um, create a tool um, that helps patient retention, that you know provides more of a concierge service, that's helping your navigators, um, helping with um, bundle payment models, um, on kind of these things. And we're seeing more and more as chronic disease and, and how we manage that. So um, you know the way people are um, managing back pain and diabetes, and there's a lot of really great models out there for us. I think people are starting to see that breast cancer plays in that same space. Um, and then also from kind of the monetization of the value of monetizing the value of the data and access to patients of clinical trial, clinical trial recruitment is that's huge. I mean, these studies, they need people, they, have, they spend a ton of money trying to get them, and, and nobody's really solved how to get these people in a sufficient manner. So we think um, we have access to these patients, how can we help um, research with that? And then also data for research and data for marketing and other opportunities as well. So. Long and short of it. So, you know, we I think we understand the patient pretty well. That's the, kind of our strongest point. We're under, starting to understand really, I think, kind of the more advanced technologies that we can harness. Um, we're really, you know, doing a lot of great work to understand the market and by kind of bringing these things together. Our next step, actually, in the month of February, is to really um, start developing some prototypes of um, what some of these kind of advanced tools can get to look like. So, um, I wish I could give this talk like a, six months from now because I think it would be really. <laughs> Um, a lot further along, but this is kind of where we are now, and um, we're really kind of at the point to really start applying some of the technology solutions to incorporate all of the research that we've done. <laughs> so, any other questions? All right, so thank you so much. No, I, was, I was just going to make the observation that what you're trying to do is persuasive human computer interaction okay. which is a, uh, a whole area there's lots of papers on getting people to change their smoking behavior mm -hmm. by using oh, yeah. these tools technology yeah it's not easy no. so thank you